Yeah. You're live. Oh, hey, wait. Okay, so welcome, welcome class. I'm glad that you are here. Today we're going into kind of really specialized. So, one of the hardiest of hardiest of hardiest and pokey of spiky things. Cactus, succulents, and the hardiest of all the plants. So, two are two plants here. Those kinds of classes. We'll be more early spring, late winter focused. Now we're into summer heat. That we teach throughout the seasons. This is kind of our thing. This is our competitive edge against the big box stores. We can teach you how to actually do it right, how to not make mistakes. I know it's return, you know, they got a great warranty, but you still put, spend all that energy trying to get this little thing to live and then it dies. We don't want that for you. We want it to live and thrive and grow. So today is cactus. Now, if you're new to the area and you're from the Midwest or someplace where you just go, oh, I've been dreaming about Arizona for so many decades, I'm finally here. I want saguaros growing in my yard. You're in the wrong elevation. It's not gonna happen. That's the first mistake many folks make uh, when they start landscaping here. They want it to look like Phoenix or Tucson, just beautiful cacti, uh, but they freeze out up here. Most cactus don't have enough antifreeze in them to keep them from turning black mush and melting over and falling over in winter. And it, it's at 32 degrees. Now, some cactus I've got here will go down to 20 degrees or 10 degrees or even sub-zero. So I'll show you those, how to plant them, how to get them to grow. I've got quite a bit of experience. I love cacti. They're kind of they're just so interesting. As long as you respect their distance, don't get too close. I'm sure I'll get poked a couple times today, but that's part of the experience when you playing with cactus. I'll also go into agaves, some of the other hardy yuccas. We actually grow more of those than we do of cactus. And there's a whole series of them that are native. They just grow wild from the Utah chintzes variety that grows up on the Grand Canyon to the Perry Eyes that grow up on the Bradshaws. We'll go into some of those. And they're, they're interesting, pokey still. Not as pokey, but sometimes you have even more luck. But if you want that texture, uh, I, I'll share those with you. And then I'll go into, some of you are in the, in the forest, in the shaded areas. You can't have cactus and agaves. They need full sun, they need wind, they need, they need blistering, they need terrible soil. You may have, your, your gardens may be too kind. So I got a few shade things just for you folks. Or the north side patio, or the areas where, what's the really hardy things that you can grow in the shade. So I thought I'd go all, through all that in about 40, 50 minutes and I'll have some time for questions. Seem okay? Yeah. Let me just introduce myself. My name is Ken. Hi. Hi, Ken. I own the garden center. God, I love this class. This, this, this side I like more than this side right now. Let's see. Hi, Ken. Yeah, thank you. I love it. You folks are online. Just say hi, Ken, right there. The, um, I've got two handouts for you. Uh, I've got, I wrote a, a book, The Low Maintenance Landscape. How do you, what are the plants? What are the design ideas? How do you deal with rock lawns? It's, if you get the, the percentage wrong, it, it could feel, it just feels off. And there's a reason for that. I, I just go into all of that. And then all of these plants will be listed as well. And then I put together a list. Welcome, come on, join us. Uh, I put together a list of the Yabapai friendly plants. And I broke it down into native. These are the ones that grow in wild. And then, but they can look a little wild. Then I went, there's, there's you have by friendly, the next step down, like Russian sage. That's this blue spiky head kind of shrub about hip high. It's got beautiful, beautiful, it's not native, but it's you have friendly the way I see it. it. It thinks it's native. So it kind of almost grows where it doesn't want, where you don't want it sometimes. So I put that list together and you can, you can curate it. It's four pages. 
I brought a copy here. I'm going to give that to you by email only because the book is like 50, 60 pages. I can't print those out times 40 people. I'm going to email it to you. It's free. You can read it on your iPad or your tablet or whatever. Um, and then the Yep by Friendly Plant List is four pages. Just It doesn't go into detail. It's just these are the plants. You can do some more research after that. Okay, so if you want that, uh, did I bring that? Did I bring the list of, I was going to be more organized. I just wanted to share this before I go down that. No, I do this first. Let me give this away. Who, the, who's here is, this is their very first garden class they've been to. Front row, really? You've been here before. I have not. Really? I've bought stuff, but I've never been to a class. Well, that's even music from my ears. She's bought things, but never been to a class. This is, I'll go ahead and just move that. That's my. Oh, that's yours. Baggage, yeah, throw it in the ground. You. There you go. Everyone's going to get a copy of that. Don't don't feel left out. It'll be there this afternoon. I'll make sure you end the book. Can you get a link to the book? Uh, but something I want to do, not to embarrass her, but just to, because I'm so doggone proud of her. Uh, Mackenzie, this is her birthday today. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah. She told me we had, we had pizza, we had, uh, we had cupcakes, and she said, I don't want anyone singing to me. I just want to sing it. So what I thought I'd do is go, can we sing happy birthday? Absolutely. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Mackenzie. Happy birthday to you. And then I thought I'd bring two pictures. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this is, uh, Mackenzie is an identical twin sister who lives in San Antonio. This is her sister. You can pass that around. She's got a... <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm proud of her. And then this is Lisa and I at the garden center when they're like just newborns. Just kind of... Just, just for giggles. I don't know. <laughs> uh, she's on the right. In the blue. Yeah. So uh, we did actually as, as identicals. You do kind of yell out, Megan, Mackenzie. They were the M&M girls. As you can't, you're not quite sure which one it is. You so just kind of need a book. This yeah. is my child, yeah. Well, you she, didn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, sorry. This is my youngest daughter of four. Four Does daughters? Pick one son. Three daughters, one son. So we've got my oldest lives in Austin, Texas. She's got one grandchild. She's donated. Very proud of her. Uh, Nico is one years old. One year old. Uh, they've been married for seven or uh, Jeremy and Kate have been married for I don't know seven or eight years. Uh, our son is next in line. He's an army captain. He's out of San Antonio, uh, and he does runs a clinic down there, kind of stuff. He's a PA, okay, so a physician's assistant. And then our twin daughters. She lives here. Mackenzie's training to take the business to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And then her twin sister runs basically Murdoch's uh, retail store. She's their fashion buyer. She's very good retailer kind of stuff. So they're raised in retail. So that's kind of for kids. So TMI, too much information. <laughs> but it's a family business. When you get done with those pictures, just pass them back to Mackenzie. She can like have those. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to the, the uh, uh, book. In the handout, give me your email address. I'll be glad to send that to you. When I get a break this afternoon, I'll sit down from my desktop. It'll be right to you. Email form. Uh, if you're part of our garden club already, it's not going to all 10,000 people. This is only going to you, to, just for me to, to you. That's it. Okay. So, um, okay. Back on task. Uh, you folks online, look on the right hand side. You'll see the links to the book. Did I send the? I forgot to send those to I'll you. Find it. Uh, it's on the website. Learn and then uh, I think it's plant friendly. One of those lists in the book. Okay, we'll get those to you shortly. Uh, while you're there, tuned in, whether YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, just like, kind of gets make a comment because Google like ranks us better, helps us compete with the box stores a little better. We'd love that. Okay, so cactus. Most cactus you cannot grow here, just get over it. There's about basically three, four, maybe five. Three. Prickly pear. This guy, this, let me get this out of the way. That pear, I'll cook myself. They grow. You have to respect all these guys. So these two, 
are related. Oh, this is a great example. This is, this is perfect. So prickly pears go down to, I believe, minus 20 degrees. And we never get that cold. So you'll see them at all the elevations. From way down low at Tucson, all the way up to the higher ridge lines, you'll see prickly pear. Uh, because they've got inside their, 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 their sap. It's got a lot of antifreeze in them. So they don't freeze out in the winter. They don't turn black. Those that don't have enough antifreeze, most of them down in Phoenix. In fact, never buy cacti down in Phoenix and bring it up here. They're just, they're not going to do well for you. They're just not going to do. They're going to thrive in the summer, then they're going to die in the winter. These guys don't do that. Okay, so with these, I would say when you plant them, don't put them on drip irrigation. Just, just plant them. And when you remember, when you're back from that RV trip up to Alaska, and you come back home, remember to water it then. So it will be, it'll do fine with that. Just neglect. If you're going to err, err on dryness, not on water. So that's the secret with most of these. Let them go dry. In fact, you can almost tell when they need water, because the pads will kind of shrink a little bit, kind of get a little thinner. You go, oh, time to water. There you go. OK. So I would say also, you folks out in the valley areas, that, that 69 corridor all the way to Cordes Junction and out, out Dewey, Presque Valley, Chino Valley, Paulden, you all have hard, heavy clay soil with a caliche layer underneath it. So it really gets, it doesn't drain or it doesn't perk. And so those soils, you, you'll need to amend pretty heavily to get the, get the soil to drain well enough. Because if you kill these, it'll be from root rot. The roots literally are too wet and they can't breathe. They need a lot of, a lot of air in their root structure. Their roots are fairly shallow. So they don't go down very deep. They're just here and they run like this because they're looking for air. They're just looking for water, air, nutrients. They're just barely underneath the surface. And so if, if you know that's how they grow, help them to grow that way. In fact, a little secret for you all, it might, you might consider raised beds, containers, or planting them on a very slight mound. So I would, like this, I would plant, I would leave that much of the root out of the ground and kind of feather the, the the guard out in the landscape next to the driveway or wherever, I'd feather that down so I could ensure at least this much of the roots could breathe, no matter how the monsoon rains come. It's the monsoons that will take them out. It's, it's March and August. That's what will, will they get oh, too wet and they rot. They turn yellow, they get off color, and they fade. There's no recovery at that point. So just kind of be aware. They need to drain. So I grow mine. A lot of them in containers. I'll show the ones I, I grow myself for years because they're. This is a beautiful plant. It's got great texture to it. This gets big. It's aggressive. How, how would you like plant? you're gonna. I would plant this in the ground. Oh, how do you? <laughs> how do you plant? So so how do you put it in the ground? Yeah. I'll dig the hole first. Usually I'll lay it down next to the ground. I'll cut this bucket off. And I'll pick it up by the roots and lay it down gently in the ground. That's how I do it. Another one, some of the shorter, shorter needed ones, you can use newspaper of all things, like traditional, old-fashioned, like paper newspapers. If you use that, that's even better than a towel or something where you can put it around there. And now you can handle it with some gloves, pick it up by the pads, and put it in the ground. But generally, when I'm planting them, I'm going to cut the bucket off, pick it up by the root ball, and put it where I want it. So there's some insider tips tricks kind of things that you do uh, respect is always the good thing so i did notice something on this it's really exciting you don't see it very often this one has pr prickly pear scale can that can you pick that up on the on the camera yeah. yeah see that white thing right there see the white right there i'll spray this as soon as we're done with some triple action i'll kill them right off but scale is a pretty common problem for all cactus but they really like prickly pears. I don't know where they come from, but they just get on there. And so you're, you're, you're always monitoring for this little white, I don't know if you all can see that. It's this little white, uh, that is prickly pear scale. So there's a little tiny bug underneath that white, that white pad. The white is a coating that protects it. And so any kind of oil will take it right out. So I'll spray it with triple action. 
that really have to work? No. Eh, I won't treat it here, but it's really easy to, to just watch for it. You can spray it. That's the one bug that gets onto cactus. Is that little one so, prickly pear also? This is also prickly pear. This is a little Rita. This is a miniature. This is aggressive. You will be cutting the pads off to keep it under control, and you'll plant it back over there, or just throw them away, or make jelly. just kind of get ready. You can make jelly or whatever. Uh, this one is very small, not aggressive, easier to take care of. When you plant that, do you still need three inches of root short on the little baby or on the big one? Um, so your question was, one more time, so the top of the root ball, this would be? Top of the root ball. You want, still want like a few inches of that showing of the baby? There? You want this to stay uh, open to the air, so don't bury it, don't bury any of these, or they can, they can rot on you. So that's a good question, though. If you're actually going to take one of these and plant the pad, which you can do, you'll cut it off, dip it in some root tone. We've got a rooting powder down there that keeps the cut from rotting, basically. Uh, and it does help it root, but mainly it keeps it from rotting. You'll let it dry out for like a week. Just let it harden off, because you don't want that new, fresh cut. You want that to callus over. Then you go plant the pads. So that's kind of kind of a, most folks cut it, plant it, and then it rots in the ground. It's, they, they missed a step. Wait a week and let it callus over, and then it will transplant better. Okay. Then you plant it two, three inches of the ground, the pad, and then it will root out from there. Okay. Cactus. Um, I don't have a lot of cacti right now because we tend to kill them even in the garden center. So we over, they just get too wet sometimes. We have more of them in the late spring, summer, early fall. Now we're into late fall, going into winter. We just have a, a, a select few. Okay. One that I grow myself, this one is called a, I'm going to move this out of the way. I'm just going to take myself out. This is a fish hook, fish hook cactus. You'll see the hooks. This is a barrel cactus. Barrel cactus are a zone eight plant. Zone eight, it could go down to 15 degrees, 10 degrees or so, and that's usually us. If it goes sub-zero, some winters we get really cold. About every 10, 12 years, we get like crazy cold. And then it clears out all the borderline stuff. Just They just die unless you protect it. So this one, it's called a fish hook cactus because the, the, the spines look like fish a fish hook. So, but it's related to the number one seller, golden barrel. This one you see, it's a common one. This is all the front of the front of magazines. They'll put it in like a saucer shaped dish and plant it and they just have it out there on a pillar or something. This is the one, okay? These, these guys are cousins. They're the same, same zone, same, they just have a little bit different look. One other, another variety of fish hook. This is a fish hook with straight hooks. Maybe this is fish spear cactus, but they're all barrel cactus. They'll go down to about 15 degrees. I've got this one growing. I'm going to put this down. They're heavy. They store, store all of their water in their main tissue, and the spines are just there to help shade it, to keep it protected from the sun. It's a shading mechanism. So this one I've, I've planted in the container, and I used, I've got a classic, a bowl shape. Planted this in there. It's been in there for years outside. I never bring it indoors. It always remains outdoors. So I do actually have it on the patio right now where it's hot, south facing. It gets all day sun, and then it's on a patio so it gets retained heat. So it's, it's hot when I never, I try not to water it. So I might water it once a month when I remember to by hand. So, and then it's, it just thrives out there. It started out this big and now it's like this big. So it has quadrupled in size. Um, it's starting to run out of soil. So I'll probably have to transplant it into a little bit bigger pot next year. Uh, but I like the look. I like it look like it's so happy it's overgrowing the the container. I think it's okay to be root bound some with your cactus. They'll take that because they're not pulling up. They're, they're really storing water up in their, their structure more than in the roots. So you can neglect it more that way. Okay. This one, the secret. 
They do make a special cactus mix. If you're putting this, whether in the ground or uh, in containers, get a bag of this. This is potting soil. This is made to plant directly into the soil, but it's got heavy, it's got a lot of perlite, those white chunky things, and cinder, uh, uh, just basically cinder, lots of real porous types of soil, so the water goes right through it. So it's made to add air to the root layer so the plants can breathe better, more so than anything else, more so than other varieties, let's say a pine tree, red tip of tinnies, lilacs. This is going to provide extra uh, drainage. Okay, so cactus mix is made for cactus, all the stuff we're talking about. This is probably the better one. Okay. What's the growth yeah. rate of cactus? What's that? What's the growth rate of cactus? The growth rate of cactus is the question. Slow. <laughs> and if you're in a hurry, slower. <laughs> They're slow. Pr prickly pears can grow a little faster, relatively speaking, compared to other things. Choya is another one, or jumping cactus. That's another or teddy bear cactus. It just goes by several days. Those are ones that will grow up here as well. We will have those in the peak of the planting season. Now, you folks from Phoenix, you know, why would anyone plant choya? It's a beautiful plant. You just have to respect it and give it space, but it's a plant about, it's a cactus about hip high. It's got, it's got a beautiful form to it. Um, but it does, if you get near it, if you even touch the, the spines, it, it wants to attach itself to you and, and go home with you. <laughs> that, that's why it's called jumping cactus. So that's another one that, that will go down no matter how cold. You'll see it all layers. It'll grow wherever you need it to. Yeah. Outside the winter. Feral cactus, all these are outside the winter. If it needs to come inside, I'll let you know. I've got a couple house plant varieties that I'll share in just a minute. But all these are made to be planted outdoors and stay out there. Now, can you bring a barrel cactus in? Yeah, you probably could in a bright sunny window. Uh, but it, it's a big plant. I mean, who wants something that big and pokey inside? It just keep. What I'll do is in the winter, when it's really getting cold, like we had some serious snow. What was it? Last February, March. We had like snow sat on the garden for weeks and weeks. I didn't want that snow sitting on my cactus for weeks and weeks as I would get root rot. The frost would take it out, it was the cold, soggy, wet would take it out. So I just brought it underneath the front patio, covered patio, that was good. <coughs> when is cactus planting time? Cactus planting time, when is cactus planting time? Now, it's when you can find them. Yeah. The peak, the, big, the biggest selection, is going to be probably May through August. That's, I've got more, I've got all the prickly pears, three or four varieties, more. I've got choyas, three or four varieties. Uh, the clear cup, little tiny, uh, little tiny ground covery little one, I'll have, I'll have that variety. I'm out right now. And once you're out of cactus, it's not like you hit a button and you hit, they're so slow growing, you run out of that crop. So as you see them, you grab them, because they probably aren't gonna be there in the next week or two. So they just disappear, because you can't, they're so slow growing. So grab, do them when you, when you can. Okay, cactus. Let's just cover a couple others. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Let's shift to agave, which we've got many more varieties to plant of agave. Or uh, the other name is century plant. The one that you'll see growing, it's a, it's a big spiky plant, and it has a huge flower that goes up 10, 12 feet. Um, it, the rumor is it blooms like that once every 100 years, thus the name century plant. Every, not really. I mean, yeah, out in the wild, probably that's the way it is. But in your backyard, I find it blooms for me every 10 to 15 years. So if it's happy and it's, and it's, it's growing, it can, just, can really grow quite luscious very quickly, and it will bloom more often. Now, when that plant is done blooming, it's called uh, artichoke agave. It's probably the number one seller because it looks like an artichoke. Uh, this is an innocent little guy. This will actually turn into this big mound, probably three by three by three, probably knee high by knee wide. Beautiful plant. Uh, this is one that has that big flower. This is the one. When that flower is done blooming, the mother plant will die. 
And then sometimes it's got pups or babies underneath it that will survive. Now the way this plant is thinking, it's got seed in the flower. So the way it crosses across the ridge line out up in the mountain tops, is he goes, I'll leave my babies here and then I'll have this huge flower and then I'll fall over and I'll seed over there 10, 15 feet away. So it's just, this is how it's programmed to repopulate or spread across to mountain range. And it's gonna do that in your yard as well the same way. So about every, I think you're every 10, 15 years, it's gonna bloom like that. And then probably you'll have a pot of them that are growing and then that will die, fall over, or you'll just harvest the flower spray paint it red or put glitter on it to tie up against the fit. They're beautiful. They're pieces. You can turn them into pieces of art if you want to. Uh, in the wild, don't collect the, the flowers out in the wild and be caught because yeah. <laughs> there's, there's fine, heavy fines for that. So you want to be really careful if you're collecting native cacti. The laws in Arizona are very stringent. I mean, you can go to jail for collecting like saguaros, that kind of stuff. So be really, I'm not, I'm not condoning it or not, not saying it's good or bad. Just I know it's done. Just be really careful. Don't let people see you collect that spent flower and bring it home um, or pads and collect, bring them home. You just want to do it at night when no one's looking <laughs> kind of thing. It's, so these guys would never, you cannot transplant these. The tap root on this is very fleshy. Very, it's, like, it's like a huge carrot, and so it holds a lot of moisture in the root structure, not so much in the pads. It does both, but it holds a lot of the moisture down here. And so when you try to dig it out, you just cut all that off, and it, it just dies to the plant. I mean, it, it'll survive for maybe two, three months, and then it just collapses. There's no recovery. Don't even bother trying. Uh, I would say the same thing with most of them, uh, most of the agaves, uh, uh, Manzanita, everyone's trying to collect manzanita to bring them home. They just don't transplant. They die almost, maybe one out of 10, 12 will live. Mostly they die. So you want to buy them from a nursery. We actually grow them from cuttings. And we, get them, we don't let that taproot take off. We control the taproot. So now you can take it home and have it transplant. So that's why there's a difference. So just kind of school of hard knocks, things that fruit people do or try. Now your gardeners, you're here, you like the funky plants, so you're, that's why you're at the class. It's a popular class. So I don't ever tell gardeners what they can or cannot do because you'll prove me wrong somehow. You'll find a way. Just the experience is going to be challenging. This one I do not plant where the grandkids are going to be playing, where the dog's wrestling, because it does have this barb to it, and it can skewer you. And when it does skewer you, generally you get infected. I'm just telling you. Just kind of don't. Give it respect, okay? How long before that one in your hand is as big as the one on the ground? So, how long before that baby one turns into these, yeah. these guys? Probably five years, oh, okay. my guess. So they're slow growing. So they put on a layer, they put on, a, they put on pads. Let's see. Can you buy bigger example. ones than that? You'll see, these mm -hmm. are all agaves. And I'm just, they're all related. They're all equally hardy, they're all uh, these are all agaves or century plants. Um, they'll put on the new growth here so they come up in the middle and they open the pads up. So they're growing from the inside out and they, they get layers of these pads going on. So they're kind of, you just get two or three of these pads a year. So over a few years you get five or six years to go from this to that. And what they're size slow. when it blooms? Like it has to be bigger than that to bloom. Oh, how big will it be when it blooms? It'll be big. When It'll we be... see them blooming, that's how big they are. Yeah, to be. They're, they're generally going to be mature. Exactly. Yeah, they're going to be mature sized. Yeah, this is this is at least ten years out before it blooms, before it's big enough to start blooming. This is probably five or seven or ten years out before it blooms. Just there, and again, if you just don't ever care for it, it could be a hundred years. The century we'll plant. Done. All these are <laughs> slow growing. Okay. So all these are down, good down to shark skin. This is a funky, fun, just a different, the, the, uh, the texture feels like a shark skin, that's the name. Uh, and it's got a more of a blue color, a more silver color. You can play with them. They're textures and colors to them, okay? That's a agave. Again, super good drainage. If you kill this, it will be its clay soil. 
just doesn't drain fast enough, or it will get a heavy snow in March. It just sits there, or it melts a little bit, but then it's so cold at night that it just stays wet, and that's when damage is done. Or we get a lot of afternoon rain in July and August. It gets too much rain in a week, and all of a sudden it drowns. So, so making sure that soil can, can get some of that moisture away from the roots is important. They're just beautiful plants. You just want to take a picture of them, throw them on Instagram. So if you already have them planted, yeah. and you see they need some more drainage, what, you can't really put them on a map. Yeah, so, so if you've got, her question is, for you folks online, we gave you a front row seat right here, like, you, like at the front seat. You're in the, you're in the spit zone. Glad you tuned in. So, um, question was, oh, if I've already got a plant and I'm worried about drainage, what do I do? Well, if they've been growing there for a while, you probably got it covered. Last March, April, it was wet. It's more moisture than I've seen in a lot of years. If it survived that, it's, it's a survivor. You're, you're covered. If it's brand new and you're worried, you could simply, and they haven't rooted out yet, could simply lift it up, get a bag of, of cactus mix and throw some underneath. That's what I would do. It's real easy to lift them up. They're slow at rooting and they're shallow rooted. So succulents are related. Succulents I think of as, it's probably the most famous right now. Um, I think of succulents as cactus without the, without the pokey part. They hold all their moisture in the, in the foliage. So now this is a hard one for you Californians. They've switched over the, the arid drought hardy succulents. Succulents are big there. And so but most of them are tropical. That is, they, they like that southern, no freeze zone, but up here, a lot of folks bring their collection with them, and then it dies out that first winter. It's heartbreaking. Every spring, it's heartbreaking. My, my, new, my, my tropical folks, Palm Springs, Tucson, California, Phoenix, they bring them up, they plant them, they're, oh, and they thrive through the summer, and then they die in the winter. You need to make sure the varieties, we are a zone seven. Zone seven means we need plants to go down to 10 degrees. That's zone seven. Zone six is at zero degrees. So that's the, 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 the zone. So garden zones are, they go from zero to about 12. The higher the zone, the more heat, more, the hotter it gets. The, the lower the number, the more cold, the more antifreeze that plant has into it. So like a lilac, that's a zone four. It goes down to minus 20 or 30, some crazy cold. Who, who lives in a place where it gets down to minus degrees that's crazy come to god's country here but we rarely see that so i think i've seen zero degrees three times in my life in my gardens i mean the blinkers they, they, everything is in slow motion the tires are hard i mean who lives in zero here we get down to, to teens maybe some single digits and then it pops right back up in the swarm. you need plants can take that this is autumn joy sedum Right now, it's got red, very bright pink flowers on it. It's about knee high out in the garden, so I surround my pond with this. And so it, it's just a bright, bright, colorful bloom right now. Super drought hardy, so again, it holds a lot of moisture in the foliage. And they've been growing there for many, many years. So they've been in for maybe 10 years. I planted it when it's like this, and now it's probably this big around and this this full. So it's it's. It's not aggressive, it's not gonna, it's not invasive. It's not gonna try to creep across the garden and take over the iris bed. It's gonna keep its bounds pretty well. It is a perennial, that is it will hide or hibernate underground through winter and it comes back fresh every spring. So usually in, in March or something, I'll cut it back real hard, just as hard as I can with a wheat whacker or hedgers, fertilize it, comes back fresh every year. I like this one because I'm a bird gardener as well. My smaller birds love this as a food source early, early spring because it's coming up with fresh new pads. And you'll see a flock of finches, just, just like 20 of them on top of this one plant. It's all doing their thing, pecking at the foliage, using it as a food source because there's not enough out in the yard coming up yet. This is coming up, so this is one of the few things that they can use. And so finally, when everything else starts to, to come alive in the spring, April, May, the pressure's off and this goes into bloom by itself. So I use that as a way to attract my late winter, early spring birds that are usually their smaller birds too. Autumn Joy Seedum, that's related to these guys. 
These are also all sedums. All three of these are ground cover sedums. We use these frequently in rock gardens. I use them in front edge of containers because they're just that they're that hardy. And then these tendrils. It's a good example. Oops, sorry. These tendrils will just grow and grow and grow, and they'll let, actually go down to the bottom of the pot. And then they'll continue to creep across. They just kind of they just want to spread through. They're a ground cover type of sedum, but these are going down to, I think this goes down to zero degrees. This is a zone six sedum. So it's a hardy variety. Okay. So it's, we're zone seven. So you can grow zone seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That and lower. As soon as you go to eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, to twelve, ten, eleven, that's Phoenix. Those don't those won't go through a winter with us, okay? So that's just so you know how to read it. I flirt with quite a few zone eights because uh, I'm a gardener. I like to see if it will live. Plus, they're funky, and I haven't grown everything else in zone seven. I want to have some fun with something else. And that's going to be your barrel cactus. Those are zone eights. So you folks out in the dewy, some Piquito Valley, those areas, you are zone eight. So... You could kind of grow those outdoors with less care. I have to actually watch the weather and bring them in when it's really cold. I'll kind of take them into my pot and bring them indoors. And I took, not indoors, under the covered patio. And that's enough. If you got zone eight stuff, I can talk offline for you. Basically, I take it in the pot and I, I haven't touched the house. And the house throws off enough heat where it just keeps that plant warm. It's amazing the difference. And so there's some, there's some tips. I don't cover mine with burlap. Some of your neighbors, will, if they're just out in the yard by the street, you'll see folks get makeshift little tents of burlap or covering. They're protecting their zone eight plants because that's a gardener. Can't tell them they can't do this. They're going to force it to happen. And so they protect them and cover them. And they can generally will keep them, keep them going. So isn't that pretty? So just the only difference is, I mean, Blonde, brunette. That's the only difference. It's just <laughs> colors and some textures, and that's they're the same plant base. They're, they are cousins. Same botanical names. So they're all sedums. These are also evergreen. They keep their foliage year round. They look like this year round. They do put on a little tiny pink flower kind of thing. It only blooms for a day. You're not planting it for the flower, you're planting this for the foliage. Okay. Great rock. Rock gardens is just fantastic. Sedums, agaves. This is probably the one wait, your grandparents wait, wait grew. Yep. I put those in my rock garden and they die. And I water them. What did you do? Do? Don't okay. water them as much. But there was not a lot of soil in the rocks either. Oh. So can you speak to? Sure. So she bit? planted these in her rock garden and they died. Why? So it's rocky, probably. Probably what happens is. Because the rocks heated up so much, they vaporized. They need, they need moisture, some moisture, but not too much moisture. So probably if I were to redo that, I would create pockets in the rock gardens. So I'd have little boulder gardens kind of thing. And I'd, create, I'd add some extra either potting soil or, or cactus mix. And I'd have a little bit deeper reservoir of soil. So your soil is wet. It's like a sponge. It holds the nutrients and the moisture. So you just need to more of that. My guess is they got too hot in that, that heat. Remember July, first part of August? It was like 100. It was miserable. It was not nice. So your plant, even my plants, some of the plants suffered from that. And so you could, they could feel. Then the pressure was off and it was six weeks of hell, of Phoenix, and then it got nice again. And so that just, that could have, that would have hurt. This one's called chicks and hen or hens and chick. Oh, hens and chicken. This is, uh, it's like the, it's an old fashioned plant. And the reason they call it hens and chicks, the mother plant has this, and then it has little, little baby chicks that come around, and it just always spreads, always bounces. So, it's just pretty. This could be a house plant, but really this is made to be outdoors. This is hardy enough, showy enough. I've got this in a, in a little saucer on my little table out by the sofa, out the front patio. It's got the west-facing sun. It's hot. Um, and I just have a bowl of these that I neglect, and it just grows. I wanted something pretty there that flowers would not live. It's too hot. 
And so this would live. It's just gorgeous. It's been out there for years. It stays out there year-round. Winter, summer, spring, all 12 months, it stays out there. It's pretty. Okay. Succulents. Goblins. Cactus. Let's cover yuccas. No, let's cover euphorbias because they're right, they're sitting right here. Yeah. Before you go on, I live yeah. in townhouse, so I have yeah. land. Love it. Um, I have a jade plant that I've had for 20 years. But I have to take it in every winter. Yes, you do. It doesn't like the sun. Yeah. I can put it under my patio cover and it grows, I have cut it to death. Yeah. But and your question I is? In California, they have these plants everywhere. So. Outside. She's got a jade plant, and she's had it for 20 years. Now, jade plants are, I mean, these are passed down like African violets. and things. They're, they're passed down for generations. And so she's had one for 20 years. She moved here from California, or she sees them out there in California. They just grow outdoors. Up here, it burns in the sun. So she's got a town home. She's got a little patio. If it gets too much sun, it tends to suffer. She brings it under a little more cover. Uh, altitude. 5,000 foot a mile up in the air, uh, down where it's more humid and more atmosphere, you can grow it right outdoors. Up here, that's a house plant. Jade plants do not grow outdoors here. They have to be brought in probably by Halloween. We're going to see our first frost within days. I mean, it's, I know it seems nice, but it's going to turn like that. And that's when you'll get caught with the jade plant. So make sure you get it ready to bring indoors. And, and the sun is so intense, it just burns it. You can't take that. If you want your jade plant to live another year, bring it indoors. It's not going to survive outdoors. Even if you cover it, unless you got a greenhouse, Arizona room, townhomes don't generally come with those, you'll want to bring it indoors. Jade plants are too that big. You're going to have to cut on it because it's going to get too big. It gets top heavy, flops over. Whack on it. Start some start some cuttings. Give it to friends. Bring them to a garden class and pass them out to friends. <laughs> Take them to the farmer's market. That's that's what jade plants are. So this is, well, I guess I should, this is the number one. This is gopher plant or gopher spurge. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a succulent. It's not a gobby. It's a unique, it's a euphorbia family. It's a whole subset of succulent kinds of plants. If you break the stem off, it has white milky sap to it. The white milky sap is actually a defense to keep javelina, okay. uh, rabbits, deer from eating the foliage. So it makes it real bitter tasting. In fact, their mouth will probably go numb as they're kind of chewing on it going, whoa, what is going on here? This is not good. Keep passing by, keep going. So this has yellow flowers to it in the spring. This will mound and just have this beautiful kind of blue mound to it. Uh, it gets up about knee high or so, about 18, 24 inches, and just spreads. So it's a great little drought hardy plant. It's related to poinsettias. Poinsettias are also a euphorbia. When you break up a poinsettia, that same white sap, that's a unique thing to, to the euphorbia family. Poinsettias are not hardy enough. They won't winter over here. These guys are, they do winter over here, okay? So this is a good evergreen plant. So I use this at the front edge of my raised beds because it's just a, I got juniper, 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 juniper. I want a, a different texture and color. So green, that's good. I put this in the front edge and all of a sudden I get blue, this spiky, this looks like it's from the dinosaur age. It probably is. And so it just has this funky, fun, easy color to it. This is also related. This is my new favorite perennial. This is uh, Rainbow Ascot Euphorbia. These guys are cousins. They're direct linked biologically, genetically. They're the same. This blonde or brunette, kind of a blonde or brunette. Yeah. So it's that. These are related. Um, I like this one because it gets up a little taller, probably about three feet knee high, and has this vase shape to it and it's evergreen. So it just looks like this year round. It does put a flower on it. It's kind of like a Dr. Seuss flower. Kind of, the flower is the same color as this foliage. You're going, is it blooming? What's, what's, is that more foliage? What is that? It's got a really funky texture color to it. Now, 
to give this plant a, a, the negative. So last winter, mine were outdoors, and they, they took it to the chin. I mean, just that snow, two foot of snow on top of the, the foliage, just bent it up and made it look terrible. So in March, when I thought we were done with the snow, took my hedgers and I just cut it right back to the ground, fertilized it, and now it looks fantastic again. So, so generally I don't do that. I just leave it up and it looks great. Last winter was more snow than we've seen in, 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 in a decade or more, and it just made it look terrible. So you can reset some of these just by pruning it, fertilizing it, it comes back again. Okay? Zone seven? Zone seven, I think it's zone six. Rainbow Ascot Euphorbia and Gopher Euphorbia, or Gopher Plant. The reason they call this Gopher Plant, the rumor is, it is totally rumor, it's not real. If you plant one of these in the ground, gophers, it'll, it'll repel gophers in the yard. That does not happen. <laughs> I've seen gophers pop up right next to it. They're the mountain. It didn't eat the plant. It ate the plant next to the gopher plant, but that rumor is not true. If you have gophers, you should kill them. They deserve to die. They're underground rats, and they eat your plants. I'll show you how to do that afterwards. Quick, quick growing, just slow growing. These are, I would say they're small plants. Are they fast or, or slow growing? I would call them slow just because they're small plants, and they're confined. They don't tend to run. Some, some plants, some of these natives, some of the natives, they really want to take over, like Russian sage. You got to, there's, you need to reset that sometimes. It only, it's only meant to grow for seven, ten years at most. Then you should dig it up and start over again because otherwise it gets seedy, it gets ratty looking. Um, it just, it's not meant to live forever. That's hard for you gardeners. What? A plant's not meant to live forever? I have to kill it? You should kill some plants every once in a while to keep them at bay, to keep them controlled. So yeah, back here. Is that Havelina safe? These are Havelina proof. These are proof. Are All of these sure? are. Oh, I am. We have a big issue with plants that they say have limits. Yeah. They devour my geraniums. Yeah, they, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So they generally have not, so she's got Havelina, and they're the bane of her garden existence. Okay, I get to summarize that. And they've stopped reading the list. So how about deer? <laughs> deer stop reading the list. They're starting to eat things we've never seen them eat before. And I think it was that, that drought from two years ago to the full rain, they were so desperate. Um, and then the building boom has, has encroached so much on their territory that they don't have the same range of, of plants they used to eat. So now they're experimenting with things maybe they haven't eaten before. We'll get into yuccas in a second, but uh, so javelina, sometimes they can eat that fleshy root. It's a starch, it's a starch thing, they'll eat that sometimes. Sometimes javelina, they just dig them up, they, it's, like a, it's like playing basketball or soccer. They just pass them around to each other, drag them around just for fun. They don't eat them. They just pull them aside, and really what they're doing, truly, when they see new soil disturbed in your garden, their protein source are bugs, like grubs and worms. They're going, hey, they did all the work for me. Let's, let's get this, throw this thing aside, and look, look down there, see if there's any worms in there, is what they're doing. So you just, you go plant it again, and probably it's okay, and it keeps going. But yeah, I, I hear you, so, yep. Oh, good. So what kind of light? I should have covered that. Sun. I would say at least at least five, six hours of sun or more. The more, the better. And if they get less than that, I've grown some in more shaded areas or filtered. They tend to get real up and they lean and then they, they can fall over. They get kind of floppy. Not as, not as good looking. I had one in the back of my house. It was a full sun. I've had it before. Yeah. But something started Oh, really? Interesting. It wasn't a javelina, was it? Because they just told someone, javelina don't eat these. Yeah. 
it's really hot there. Uh, it, it should be okay. So, so, so she had one of these and it died in full sun. Now, I have had rabbits eat this one before. The foliage, they didn't eat the stems. They ate the leaves off. So they left it with just stems. So I, I sprayed some, some rabbit repellent, basically, and it came back fine. Because it was late winter when nothing else was out there. I think they were trimming on it because they were desperate. And then once the season hit, it was now gorgeous, it was beautiful. Rabbits are still out there, and it's beautiful. I think it was a seasonality thing where they were hungry. They just didn't have their normal stuff. So that, that being said, all bets are off with nature. I'm not <laughs> sure will pack rats eat it. Generally, no. I've got this right out in a pot right where javelina roam every night and it's fine so but your herd might not talk to my herd and so you get some of that you notice we never say proof we say resistive there's a reason for that because generally speaking they leave this alone if there's anything else to eat out in the yard they will do that but if it's the only thing and they're hungry they'll try it Things like deer, they've got, they're like cattle. They've got two stomachs, so they'll start eating something. And before they realize it's actually digesting, they've eaten half of it before they go, oh, yeah, that's right, I don't like this. And they move on. So they'll eat some things before they're, they're used to it. Okay? Yuccas, we're back to yuccas. You all keep derailing me. Let's cover that. <laughs> yuccas and Hesperalis. They're both really, they're all kind of the same. I thought I had some big yuccas. Yeah, very so all of these guys will grow outside, full sun, at least six hours of sun or more. Even you folks on the ridge lines, we get those beautiful vistas. And it's so windy, you can hardly be outdoors. It'll take that wind, it'll take that sun. It takes, these are very, again, they've got a very fleshy root system to it. So it goes down like an agave. They go down, they go down real deep. And so then they hold that moisture at, in the foliage. You notice a lot of these, the way these things are, You'll just see how a lot of these natively looking plants, how the foliage is kind of bringing all the water. This is rain harvest. They've, they've trained, they've, they've created a rain harvest system where they're picking up the moisture and bringing it to the heart of the plant so that the, that fleshy root can gather up the little bit of moisture that actually comes at certain times of the year. So this yucca is the same way. They're pulling up that. They're bringing the foliage and they're bringing just to bring it to bring the rain to the heart of the plant. So it's it's a that's what makes them so robust. And so this is probably number one seller. This is red yucca. Uh, it's the one with the red flower on it. Uh, it's been blooming for three four months since May. It's been blooming. Now it's starting to put on seed pods. You'll see a got a golf ball size seed pod. I just leave those on. Um, I've actually, they're front, but some place where you can enjoy it. You spray paint them red. Now those all of a sudden they look like holidays. Yay! You can have fun with them. Uh, but basically, sometime in winter, you're going to cut that flower stalk off as far as you can down to the base and leave the rest of the foliage. This is an evergreen plant. The mistake I find some landscaper, your, your gardener, that might be helping take care of the neighborhood, they couldn't find a job anywhere else. They just had to pick up a truck and a shovel. They, they, sometimes they're not the smartest. They may or may not know plants, but they know how to run a, a weed backer, a blower, and a rake. So just sometimes, the mistake I've seen is they'll come through and they, they treat it like a grass, and they cut it back in late winter, and it just, it takes, two years for, for a yucca to recover from that. This is not a grass, this is a yucca. So it's the, this foliage should remain, okay? The flower stalk should be taken off. That's the that's difference, okay? Don't let your gardener make that mistake. Can you grow Just tell seed? them what you want them to do, okay? So What's that? Will the seeds grow? Can you plant the seeds can grow, although we start these ourselves by cuttings because seeds are so painfully slow uh, and inconsistent. So we want that bright red flower. If you're starting by seed, a yucca plant, it might come in yellow or salmon. It might be red. You just never the genetics are playing out. 
we're trying to provide clones. We actually sell clones. They're exact. They're all going to be the same. So the variation, you get that by cuttings. So we'll take a cutting, start it, root it. Then you get an exact copy of the mother plant that was right there. Is the cutting too? Red yuccas are good. This gets up probably knee high or so. And the flowers will stand up about hip high. Okay. This is the same exact plant, only it gets big. This one's like the giant of yuccas. This gets probably four or five feet large. If you got a big block fence, you want something spiky, the yucky, not yucky, yucca -y out in the corner, this one would, would show better because it's got some size to it. This one's going to only get just, just this big. It's cuter. This one looks better in containers. Uh, we're in a raised bed. Uh, this one probably looks better by the driveway because it just has more substance to it. So you get the size. Same flowers hovering above, uh, but, but just a bigger girth, bigger size plant. Are they related? What's that? What was the name of the big one? Oh, this is uh, <laughs> Hesperella. Oh, my gosh. I don't remember. Oh, little giant yucca. <laughs> little giant Hesperella. Same red flower? Yeah. These can come in yellow. So this one comes in yellow and red. Reds were popular this year. The hummingbirds like the yellow actually better. Actually, the hummingbirds like all yucca flowers. They just, they're drawn to them. They're, they're an actual food source for them. Um, but yuccas, same thing. Drainage, drainage, drainage. If it's going to suffer, all these we've been talking about, it's going to be, it didn't drain. Except for your rock garden. Just give it some more soil, but it's, it drained. So if you drain, it just got too hot. Okay. Your uh, euphorbia, gopher plant. That's rabbits. Probably it was an anomaly because you've grown it before. I think it's something, something happened. That's gardening. You learn by making mistakes. This is not 100%. These are like puppy dogs. You're taking them home, you're planting them, and you want them to survive, but it's gardening. Even I make some mistakes. I think sometimes we need to forgive ourselves. Forgive yourself. You deserve it today. We're glad you're tuned in. Um, sometimes you need to just kind of, it's OK. I lost one. I'm going to try again. So yellowing of the leaves is, is over water. Okay. Yellowing the leaves is over water. Okay. Always. Virtually always. Browning of the leaves is lack of water. So for just about anything. But especially the, the, the these kind of things, or pine trees, or conifers. Conifers, if they get yellow, it's almost always over water. If they get brown tipped, it's almost always under water. This is soft leaf yucca. This will actually turn into a miniature tree. It actually gets a stalk on it, and then it has multiple. You'll never get just one. They like to grow in colonies or groups. They're very social, very family oriented. So you get this big cluster of soft leaf yucca. It does this year round. It's, 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 it's evergreen, and the flowers above it are quite large, and they're white. Beautiful, soft white to it. So okay. if you want a little more substantial yucca, this is the one. How okay. tall does it get? It'll get up good chest high, something like this. Okay. It gets pretty pretty big size. Okay. And there's no soft leaf yucca is the name. And you all can come up after and take pictures of, of tags or whatever. We'll talk more. Dang it, and this pokey, it's soft, but not that soft. It's softer than some of the others. Okay. Again, any of these guys, when it's done blooming, just cut that flower off as close as it's comfortable for you to cut it back, just reach down as best you can and cut it off. Dang it, God really got me. I'm just careful to cap this in I'll just show you this one. Can I lift it? Ah. That is an adult version of this. Same plant. This is mature. This is baby. So. This is a shark skin agave. agave. What's the age difference? Probably five, six years. This has been the farm for over five years. This is probably two, three years old. Just started. What's the age difference? I'm going to draw blood. Okay. From a soft leaf like a ball of this. Let me show you. I said shade. What are we doing? We're running out of time. Chat too much. 
shade, like they're super tough, but they'll take the shade. Not this one, these guys. Hard shade, these, none of these we've talked about will grow. They just, they need more sun than that. These guys are equally as tough in the shade, but they won't take the sun. So you folks out in that pine covered, the hidden valleys, uh, where you've got a lot of, or north side, covered patio, what do I have that I can, I can neglect and it will grow? So this one's called U. I've got U's on the north side of my house. Now I have my back, my front yard is high garden. It must be touched. It must be watered. It is total waste of resources and my time. But I'm a gardener and it's good for me. And I like this. This is my hobby and I want to do this. And so I'm okay with a little bit of water in July and June just to keep things going. The backyard is hardcore native. It better look good all the time. And I don't want to ever go back there and garden. Once a year, we'll clean it up and that's it. You better thrive on your own. So I've got two spaces. I've got a small space for me, and then another space back there that's, that's ready. The party's always going to be on. It always looks good, uh, but it's just less care. So this one I use back there. It's not a native, but I got a two-story stucco wall that's ugly as can be. It just it looks terrible. So I needed something to soften that up. And so I took a Hicks U, uh, Y-E-W, and now it's growing up, it's almost two stories tall. It's covered up that, that whole yucca, that whole stucco thing. Um, I used to have art in between it that would uplight it, that statue kind of thing. Just I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my lemons into lemonade, basically. And it, it's stunning. Now it's gotten so thick, it's just a green wall, but I don't water that anymore, maybe. I think I just backed it off to once every 10 days gets watered. But because it's on the north side, it doesn't get sun, it doesn't dry out. Because it's got so much foliage, it shades itself, protects the soil so it doesn't dry out. It's defending itself. Uh, so there's, there's ways to use non-natives with your native gardens, especially in the shaded areas of your garden. That's just the lesson I'll give you real quick. So this is you. It's actually a conifer. It's related to junipers, uh, spruce, does have a, it's got a needle, not a leaf. It's evergreen. Okay, deer, deer and javelina, proof, <laughs> almost guaranteed. So it just kind of they don't like the, the taste of this. You, this is one that's growing wild. It's been in color for a month, just about to, to get done. This is Virginia creeper. You see this growing wild the branches I mean, up in the ridge lines. Uh, usually in the shaded areas, you'll see it in the ground cover. It can grow up rock faces. It'll take full sun. It's one of the few vines that will take full shade as well. And it is a true native. Get it up to go, get it going, get the size you want, and you don't have to care for it again. You can just let it go. Uh, so Virginia creeper. Uh, its cousin is Boston ivy. On the east coast is Boston ivy. Out in the west is Virginia creeper. Uh, the difference is this one's got five five uh, leaf nodes. Virginia, uh, Boston ivy has three, but they're both turning red right now. Actually, Boston ivy is more of a, an orangey color. This is a brighter red, but truly a native plant, especially in the shade. And this one is a weed. <laughs> English ivy. Ivy is just a shade lover. I mean, I, you just neglect it, it always looks like this. It is a very robust, this is the one that you gotta be careful. It wants to creep through the wall and have dinner with you. It wants to come inside. It just, it's very mischievous. It wants to attach itself to things. If you stand still very long, it'll like grab your pocket and wanna take off with you. This is another shade, hard shade. If things don't grow, this one will grow. And then these two are kind of related. This is, uh, both are hollies. Now, you, you folks from the East Coast, your holly grows right out there in full sun. You're not in, in Virginia anymore, Toto. This is like, this, this is not a sun-loving plant here at this elevation with our dryness. It likes more of the shaded areas. So I would give these plants no more than six hours of sun, and I would prefer it not to be that 10 to 2, 
middle of the day, sun in June. Morning sun's great, afternoon sun's fine. Midday in June, these are going to vaporize. I know it doesn't do that in other parts of the country, but here at this elevation, that's what happens. So this is the classic one, gets the red berries, the whole holly, holiday thing, that's this one. This is called Yoshiki holly. In Japanese, that's called five colored holly, because as it grows, you'll see different, five different colors show up on it, but it's the same holly leaf to it. Both of them are very robust, and the reason they're so tough in the shade, they got this leaf that's very thick and waxy, so it's very efficient on its evaporation. It doesn't perspire, so it controls its, its water use, so more shade-loving kind of plants. That, I think I'm coming down to it. I brought a couple others just because they're related. I don't know. Then we'll, I'll finish with these and then we'll take some questions. Oh, soap tassel. I forgot that. It's a native. These two guys you'll see growing out in the wild. You'll see a bush kind of about this big. It's got red berries. It has white flowers in the spring. That's Cotoneaster. Uh, this, this is a wild evergreen native -y plant. I know it doesn't pertain to cactus and succulents, but it's that tough. So it can go right out there. It gets up. If you need something a little bit bigger, and this goes down to crazy cold. You can't kill this. So if you just put it on a drip irrigation, don't water too much. So a little bit's good, a lot not so good. This is soap tassel. If you see a bigger plant, probably about this big, that's this plant. Go around the wild, so down towards Kirkland, Skull Valley, those areas, you're seeing this grow wild down there. So usually 3,500 to 5,000 foot level. This guy is growing out there evergreen, has a pretty flower to a little tiny berry. Um, I put this in my backyard because it's got this picket fence. It's just, it's too much fence. I need it softened. Uh, and so I just I planted it and I did not put on the drip system. I just watered by hand sometimes. Actually, I probably don't even need, I do, I water it by hand so that I feel better, not so the plant feels better. That's the only reason, but a good little evergreen for here. Silk tassel plant. Yeah. Shade or sun? So this one is a sun. This, these are both sun. Yeah, sorry about that. These are full sun. I would say at least six hours of sun or more. Otherwise, it gets tall and flops over. Sun is better for these guys. And abuse, sun and abuse. This one gets this big, this one gets Kind of these, this big, hip high, chest high, yeah. Cotton Easter, yeah, or Cotone Aster. It's spelled Cotton Easter, but you pronounce it. Go, go for Latin. I don't know. I don't know. Cotone Aster. We, if you mention it by either name, we'll know what you're talking about. And there's quite a few varieties. Uh, I want to mention two things that you should be doing right now. Uh, if you've got pine trees, you should treat them with drench, tree shrub drench. Bark beetle is a serious thing. For you new folks, you really got to up your, do some knowledge, do some research on this. For the folks that have been here for a while, you know, entire neighborhoods have been taken out because bark beetle got in them and killed them. So this is a drench, you mix it up in a watering can, Put it right at the base, the plant takes it up, and it's like an antibiotic. It keeps the bugs out of the tree for a year. It's this is the time to do it. At the same time, just mainly just conifers, just your pine, spruce, cypress has a has a tip where I'm your evergreen things I would do this with. Tree uh, alligator juniper. Alligator juniper, not so much. Unless you see spider mites, unless you've had issues, I wouldn't do it. They can get spider mites. So I did do it a couple of years for mine, just because it had, uh, here, here you go, take a picture, you taking a picture? And it was. And then I'll show folks online, you can see what it is. So. Did you say pines and junipers? Pines and juniper, there you go, tree and shrimp drench. Awesome. And if you want more, this, this is not the class, just, just putting some things, now's the time. Okay. Also, there's not, there's a native beetle that's not the bark, that, that if at the tip of the juniper you see a reddish orange. Yeah. And they're starting to go. Yeah, it's tip-board. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Right. If you see bugs on junipers, do it. If you're in yes. doubt, do it. There's some things, but pinion pine scale and bark beetles and ponderosas, those I say you have to do. 
the others you need to do if you see an issue. I'm not into treating the whole forest. We're just putting out pesticide just because. But some things, especially that you built your deck around the ponderosa. I mean, you built the pinion pine is so striking, but the juniper is so gorgeous. You, you, if you were to lose it, your property value literally would, would, would tank. Do those. Yeah, everything else, I don't know. And then fertilize. I thought I brought a, brought a bag of fertilizer. You should fertilize everything in the yard right now. It is the most important feeding of the year. Um, this is granular food. All-purpose plant food. Um, this is an organic food you put out there. The reason this is the most important feeding, the plants are taking up this nutrient now. And it's going to use it for next spring's growth, flowers. If you want lilacs, you need to fertilize now. If you want fruit trees, you need to fertilize. Roses, you need to fertilize now. For spring blooming things, for Cynthia, quince, you need to fertilize now. If you don't, you're going to come back in two or three years. And again, my lilac was so beautiful for, for so many years, and now it hasn't bloomed for two years straight. Because you didn't fertilize. Fertilize now so that it can form those flowers, form those new growth for next spring. Seems counterintuitive. It's the most important feeding of the year. For our pine trees, pine trees typically, all your conifers, they only grow one time in the spring. They elongate their new growth. Whatever you get, that's all you get for the year. You get one chance. You fertilize it now to have more beautiful pine trees, conifers in the spring. So it's, it's kind of a can't. Drench or fertilizer, which one first doesn't matter. Which one do you have in your hand? Do that one first. It makes no difference. The drench is going to take longer to, to activate to get up the tree. This is going to release over the next three months, over all winter. Every time it rains or snows, a little bit of food will release. That's the beauty of organics. So that's just two things that don't pertain to the class, but it's so important. I want to share it with friends, just so you have better gardeners, gardens. Or have your gardener do it, whatever. Questions, we're wrapping it up. How are we doing? Do we answer them on the fly or do you okay? Yeah. Um, my succulents, I bring them in, they're potted. I bring them in for the winter. They're on grow lights because it's dark in the house. I wonder sometimes if I'm going to have a warm week or two, do they want to go back outside or just move it back and forth? I love it. Hard. Okay, for you folks online or over here, she's got a succulent. She's a hardcore gardener. She's got a, a section closet with grow lights and she's got this whole setup. That's a gardener. So there's medication for that, by the way. <laughs> so, or plants, or plants. So she wants to know, can I bring some of those outdoors? Just let them have some fresh air sometimes. Yes, they would really appreciate being outdoors in the full sunlight. The negative, because the temperature swing, we can literally go 50, 60 degree temperature between day and night. If you make a mistake, and they're tropical, if they're tropical varieties, if you make a mistake and leave them out one night, it, all it takes is one time to go down to 28 degrees. That's the magic. 28, they're vaporized, and there's no recovery. So yes, they would like to be outdoors in the sun, take a breather during the day but at night bring them in for sure so yeah be careful be careful that's a tropical succulents anyone else Doing okay yeah yeah I brought that Madagascar palm I brought it because I was going to teach the lesson but I thought we covered it this is a house plant so not an outdoor plant so I think we pretty much outdoor in California this grows outdoors I hear it does not to so be like the jade plant kind of thing so bring outdoors during the during the summer but you want to bring it in by the, the first frost date which is October 28 which is days away hours away from the first frost I know this is fools you but it's going to turn quick so these kind of plants you want to bring indoors and protect them okay yeah good I'm glad you caught that very good yeah Yeah, autumn choice sedum. Nope, not a colancho. It's different, totally different plant. Has sort of that look. Yeah, doesn't it? But it's got different, totally different look. And it's this is just a hardy variety of succulent that you don't bring indoors. It won't be happy indoors, even in grow lights. It wants to be outdoors in the cold. It wants to hibernate underground and then take a break. Yeah. I have a big jasmine outside in a pot. 
Yeah. So she's got a big jasmine. So she have to bring it in. It's a tropical plant. So casters are your friend. She's got a big one. Now they get heavy. I mean, they get. They can be serious weight. Roll it in or something. Or you start taking cuttings. You go. Okay, it's time to reset. Start over. That's how people pass down jade plants. It, it's not the original plant. It it outgrew itself two decades ago. They've taken cuttings and kept that plant going for decades. So it may be time to reset. Start over. It's got to be indoors, though. Yeah. Something else, yeah, on this side. Um, we have already been planted big, tall cactus. They're skinny yep. with long, almost like ears. They're yeah. huge. Yeah. And some of them are starting to block over and yellow. I don't even this know. This is indoors or outdoors? Outdoors. outdoors. For years. Nice. But I don't know what they are. <laughs> um, they're not. Uh, but a cactus starting to flop over, what do you do is a real question. Yeah, and they don't have all the <laughs> Yeah, you're probably going to, if they're flopping over, you either got to stake them, or you might cut that one off. If, they're, if there's a cluster, you might do some selective pruning, cut it back so the others can have all the energy, and so the pups, the, the babies, can now take over and take the reins from their parents. So sometimes you see, it's okay to prune a cactus. You can cut back the pads. You can control the growth. It's not going to hurt it. It's going to help the re remaining plant. Something else? Yeah. Is there anything that we should be planting like in the next week or two? For, well, so is there something you can be planting now? All the stuff we have in the garden center, you plant, it's made to plant now. So we've, we've changed the garden center. So you're starting to see the last of the butterfly bush. There's a few out there. And they're beautiful. The butterflies are all over. And you can plant them now. But we're not going to reorder. Once those are gone, we're out for the season. But we're replacing those with the evergreens. So hollies are coming in. Lots of spruce. Lots of pine trees. Lots of junipers. Lots of cotoneas. All the evergreen things. This is the time when they, they look their best. You get the most selection. It's time to put them in the ground. Bigger plants, uh, big uh, spruce trees, uh, maples, they're best to be planted now because they'll root for the next couple months. Uh, and then they'll root again starting in spring. So as they start to flood, you'll get much more growth next spring by planting now. Will they same for fruit trees? Fruit trees, yeah, if you can find fruit trees. That's, that's a challenge. So if you find them, great. It's best. It's just the selection. The crop's been been ravaged. There's not many left. I think I got a few nectarines, some cherries. So fall and spring. Fall and spring. Actually, here we plant because we're so mild. We're not like Phoenix. We don't shut down in summer. We keep planting. It's our second busiest season. Uh, we're so mild in winter. We're not like Flagstaff or Wisconsin. We don't have any foot frost line. We have an eight millimeter, if any, frost line. So we keep planting. So we, you can plant year round. What's the difference is the crop rotation. So I, have a li I don't have a lilac in place. Because the time to plant those is when they're all in bloom in spring. So we load up in the springtime and more selection. So it's all about seasonality of crop rotation more than can I plant it. So yeah, good question in the back. The autumn joy sedum does get flowers. It is right now in full bloom. Full, you can't see the foliage. Nothing but solid bright pink flowers. And I'll keep that structure. It'll turn brown by Thanksgiving. It'll hibernate underground. I'll keep that structure up because it's pretty. But eventually the snow is going to come and light up. It just kind of makes it look ratty looking. Kind of beats it up. And I, that's usually in January. I'll come through and hedge it down and Start over again. Yeah, there's a question here. Yeah. Yeah, the sedum, the trailing one. Yeah. The pretty green one. Yeah. So I could put that in a container in my rock garden and leave it out all winter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You know the event. They've been promoting it for a week. It's going to be so. It's going to be cold. People run to the grocery store. They empty the shelves in preparation for the, you know, the snowed today, melted yesterday, <laughs> kind of kind of event. When before that event happens, what are your plans? It's going to get real cold. We're going from this kind of weather down to it's going to be cold. I'll go out and hand water my containers. They go through like champs. If they're dry, the antifreeze is naturally in the structure of that plant, can't flow, and so you'll get tip burn or winter kills, what we call it. The, the outer branches will die back. And so that's for the whole yard, that's the case. We say water two times a month, even in midwinter, uh, to keep that to, to keep the hydraulics of the plant flowing. Uh, so you have less damage. It's, it's a game changer. So that would be something different here than you've seen other parts of the country. But it's because it's so nice, but it's still cold. So you get tricked into, and your landscaper is going to come in and turn off the irrigation next month. Many, many of them. And so you're not going to want, we have real dry spells. We can go two, three months without any moisture. That's when you need to hand water or activate the system by hand. Just break out the old-fashioned hose and water it. Especially new things. It's a, big, it's a really big, big game changer for containers. It's, it's highly effective for containers. Are we wrapping down? Yes, you're my last question. Unless anyone has something online, you've got to type it quick. We'll come back at you. What kind did I show you? I forgot. Right behind you. Flowing. 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 This one? Oh, this one. These guys. See them? Yeah, all these guys are, are related. Just pick the color you like. They come in different colors and textures. They're fun to play with. I use these a lot in my containers at the front edge because they flow. This is as tall as they get. You see they're just starting to grow and flow. So they really soften up that, that uh, raised bed, containers, that kind of stuff. And they're fun. And they're hardy. They're just tough as can be. These two guys, four of you, where'd they go? This would be beautiful. What are you Let's just put this, it gets up to knee high or so, base shape. This is the front overflow. You've got yourself a evergreen, right through winter, beautiful container by the front door. And as your guests and family come for the Thanksgiving dinner, they're going, Wow, you're such a gardener. How did you do that? Well, I know this guy. He has classes on Saturdays. <laughs> so they, he taught me how to do that. Do they work as ground covers or weed suppressors? They, they do, yeah, they sure do. With that, I will hang out as long as you want. Come see the plants. I'm not going anywhere. If I missed your questions, I'm just here. But before you go, I'll let you clap. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Next week, I have a special guest. So Mackenzie and I are going to Europe for a few weeks. But I have a guest speaker, Jim Roop. He's the... The uh, Monrovia Growers Representative, they are the Cadillac dealers of, of plants. He's the foremost expert on, on plants here in our area. He has agreed to come and teach next week's class. He, he'll, I'm sure he's going to use Latin. He's a hardcore garden nerd, but he's super